Hello, this is Wine Blast. Welcome to our wine-soaked world. In this episode, we're trying to get our heads around just how climate change can be painted as a positive. In this case, for English wine prospects. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird old one, isn't it? Um, it's kind of a paradox. On the one hand, you know, climate change is this big bad thing. It, you know, it threatens our existence as a species. And, you know, we have to act now. But on the other hand, we're also talking about adapting, um, sort of seeking solutions and and I guess it, not falling into the trap of sort of excessively catastrophizing. Mm. You know, I guess as well that wine can be a wonderfully escapist sort of time out from the real world. So here's a quote which sort of sums this up. We're in an almost perverse situation where we're looking at climate change as an opportunity, an underlying opportunity in the UK. And all of the evidence points to a huge land area in the UK that has potential for vine growing that is really high quality. Perverse indeed. Mm. So that's Dr Alistair Nesbitt, climate scientist and wine consultant. And we'll be hearing more from him in due course because part of our reason for doing this programme was a paper he recently published entitled... Climate change projections for UK viticulture to 2040 a focus on improving suitability for Pinot Noir. Snappy. Snappy indeed. So, uh, so this research examines how climate change and rising temperatures look set to supercharge English wine, including making the regular production of high-quality still wines, particularly red wine, a very real prospect. Mm, but it's never quite that simple, is it? Uh, not really. These things never are. So in this programme, we're not only going to cross-examine Alistair on his paper and its findings, um, we're also going to be bringing in the views from the vineyards, if you like, uh, of England, well, particularly Kent, uh, hearing from Charlie Holland at Gusbourne, uh, Ben Walgate at Tillingham, Adrian Pike at Westwell and Fergus Elias at Balfour. Uh, on top of that, we're going to throw our two cents into the pot, aren't we? Mm, yeah, you well, guys would be disappointed maybe more than if, two. We, if we did. I think probably near a ten. Yeah, well, you're we? always a big At investor. <laughs> we always appreciate your contribution. Uh, you know, I'm generous. You are very generous. That's the word. Generous, generous. with your views, uh, because you know this is a contentious issue, and there's lots to be said. There about is it. indeed. There is indeed. It's also very topical because 2022 has mm. been such mm. a torrid year in Europe, incredibly hot and dry. And um, in fact, I. have just read that the European Drought Observatory has reported 2022 saw Europe's worst drought in at least 500 years, with two thirds of the continent in a state of alert or warning. You say 500 years. 500 years. Yeah. That's insane, isn't it? I suppose yeah. it makes sense, though. Yeah. I mean, for those everyone who lived through it, it was yeah. it was pretty 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 hot and dry and pretty dry, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, all of which is, of course. Yet another sign of climate change. Um, mm. But then again, warm and dry conditions are what you need for wine growing in cooler climates like the UK. Mm. So mm. we wanted to catch up on how this vintage is looking for English wine growers and what it might mean for the future. Yeah. On which note, we did get a question from listener John, uh, who wrote, what do you think the effect of the scorching summer weather and drought will have on the English wine vintage this year? I just wondered if it will make for better wines or terrible wines. Short answer, John, better wines. Um, good question. Much better. It is a very good question. Yeah, much better wines here in the UK, especially the still wines. I mean, elsewhere, things are more complicated. But I don't want to preempt what we're going to get into in this episode. Now, we did touch on similar issues in our episode last year, English Wine Now What? Mm. Uh, series 3, episode 2. It is. But this latest research, in conjunction with the 2022 vintage, make this whole issue incredibly relevant right now. Yeah, and, and I think fascinating, or mm. we think fascinating, to take a look at no, another this, look this at. Is, this, is, this is really, really, uh, you know, hot stuff. So do check that programme out. It's well worth dipping into. Um, now, you've also just written a piece for Decanter magazine, haven't you, on mm -hmm. English still wines. I have indeed. Uh, with some very tasty recommendations, <laughs> oh, as far as I remember. They, they really are. Um, so that's the Christmas 2022 issue. And we've definitely been tasting, haven't we, some seriously exciting still English wines yeah. recently. Yeah, we really have. And just thinking about it, didn't didn't um, the still wines do particularly well in the Wine GB Awards this year? They, they did, yeah. Yeah, they did. And mm. what I, I think what I'm noticing is that each year at the awards the still wines just get that little bit better across an increasing range of styles, mm. which I think is partly to do with climate change, but also on the back of that, producers putting more focus and an effort into making top quality still wines. Interesting. So, so sort of 
right from the outset setting out to yeah. make still wines rather than being, let's say, a byproduct of sparkling. Well, yeah, or you're or, thinking, or oh gosh, the vintage is actually really, really good. Maybe we'll yeah. make some still. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, and so that's really, sort of having confidence that yeah. they can make them yeah, and they will the, be good. The, and, the weather will be good enough. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And presumably they can sell them. Anyway, uh, yeah. on that note, shall we? Shall we bring in, you know, our very own doctor? Doctor. Doctor Who. It's not Doctor. Ooh, Who. Not Doctor. <laughs> it's not Doctor. It's <laughs> spoiler. It is not Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> Although he does do an element of time travel, oh, thinking dear. about it. Well, anyway, so, so you, I'll yeah. let you We're going off introduce one here, our very we? own yeah, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to, <laughs> let's, let's get real. Dr. Alistair Nesbitt. Um, mm. He is a viti climatologist. Um, That's a pretty cool s- title. Yeah, though. it is yeah, indeed. Not, doctor Who is not a viti climatologist. No, no, maybe he is <laughs> Maybe he should be. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Alistair Nesbitt is uh, not only a viti climatologist, he's also CEO of Vinescapes, a company that helps develop vineyards and wineries, mainly in the UK, but, but also abroad. Now, we first got to know Alistair when we interviewed him for the mini Mm. book we wrote called The Essential Guide to English Wine. Essential stuff. Um, And as a quick aside, actually, he's now been joined at Vinescapes by our friend and superstar winemaker, Emma Rice, formerly of Hattingley Valley, Mm. just down the road. Mm. Uh, But we've been aware of Alistair's work on English viticulture and climate change for some time now. Yeah, he's done fascinating work, hasn't he? And this is where we first picked up on him. Mapping in great Mm. detail which parts of the country are are sort of most suitable for wine growing Mm. overlaying data on climate altitude aspect all that sort of stuff Um, and and part of what he does as you said and it's important to say this is to offer a consultancy service for people who want to know if their land is suitable for wine or not so Mm. you know if you're wondering out there your back garden your garden your yard your field (laughs) is it a grant well my garden I don't think it is Uh, but you never know Uh, if you're wondering he's your man you know apparently you could even get a straight yes or no for free well i think you can get a no you're probably right you can get a yeah, <laughs> no right, yes. just no, <laughs> no um, do, do, yeah. do cabbage instead uh but uh, <laughs> alistair is also an academic of course and he's been crunching the data to look into the future yeah yeah so, th- so this research models what might be happening by 2040 and it is quite something mm. the paper begins by saying the uk's 10 warmest years on record have all occurred since 2002 mm. and 2018 was the warmest summer in the southeast and south central England since records began in 1884. Oh, wow. I mean, I wonder where 2022 will end up Who in knows? that sense. Um, it's because it's going to be up there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it has to be. It has to be. Yeah. Anyway, we yeah. caught up with Alistair at his HQ in Surrey to discuss all this and more. And I began by asking him to tell us about his research. OK, well, we've spent the last two years looking at what the next 20 years might hold for viticulture and wine production in the UK. It's something that hasn't been done before. A lot of people have looked historically at what trends have occurred in climate and the relationship between historic climate change and vine growing in the UK. We wanted to look to the future to see what the future holds. Um, We looked at a whole range of different climate models. We looked at scenarios from different um, sparkling wine and still red wine um, areas of Europe in terms of weather and climate. And we modelled how they may play out in the UK and what that might mean for vine growing and wine production. So if we just dial back a little bit, I know you were looking at the future. First of all, how exactly have average temperatures changed in the UK over the last few decades? And then what is the forecast in that sense for the future? Well, within the main wine growing region, so South East, South Central England, Over the last couple of decades, we've seen growing season average temperatures increase by about one degree Celsius. That may not sound much, but that's the difference between being able to grow the more historic varietals of Muller-Turgau, Reichensteiner, Seval Blanc, and the varieties which are predominant now, so Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Meunier, Bacchus. That's quite a significant change. Looking to the future... The climate change models we looked at using one scenario of what may happen, and it's sometimes called worst case scenario, but it's the scenario we're working and living with now. We can see another 1 to 1.5% increase in growing season temperatures over the next 20 years, out to 2040. So that again is a further significant increase. And the implication being that that change in variety and wine style could keep moving and we could see still wines becoming much more viable in the UK. Now you foresee greater potential suitability for and quality of red wine in particular. Um, Certainly this report looks at that. Will red wine, will red Pinot Noir become the UK's calling card? You know, will will it take over from sparkling wine, which is 
obviously the the our USP right now? It, in some locations, I, I do believe it will. Yes, we've seen there are some trailblazers out there at the moment already making fantastic Pinot Noir. Um, in some years, in other locations, people are able to make still Pinot Noir in just one or two years out of ten. But we think that viability is going to become more common going forward. So the potential for producing still Pinot Noir um, in England and parts of Wales increases. At the same time, however, the reliability of growing season conditions for sparkling wine also increases, which means better consistency, better yields, and a much wider geographic location for sparkling wine production. So I wouldn't say we'll go down one route and not the other, but actually the expansion is for both types of wine. So should producers be planting vines for still wines now, would you say, if they want to make some still wine? You know, for example, the right clones, so they're not planting sparkling clones, they're planting literally the right clones for still wines. Well, one of the... um, one of the things to consider when we talk about climate change is variability and risk and resilience to that in the future. And I think that the phrase we use with our clients is don't put all your eggs in one basket. The beauty of still Pinot Noir clones, Burgundy clones, such as 777, is you could use those in a sparkling wine in a year that isn't warm enough to achieve the ripening profile required for still wine. But then in a warmer year, in a good year, such as 2018, you might be able to produce still Pinot Noir. So that's one answer. The other answer, which is more direct, is in certain parts of the UK, there is really significant potential for still red Pinot Noir. So if you believe you've got a market for that and can model the production towards that market demand, absolutely there's viability now for still Pinot Noir production in certain locations. So now you say um, of the next 20 years, and I'm going to quote now from the report, in certain years, a few areas of the UK may see growing season climates similar to those that contributed to the very best recent vintages of Champagne, as well as support increased potential for Burgundy and Baden style still red wines. Now, we should say Baden is is one of the few areas in Germany that's known for producing good red Pinot Noir. But is this research also potentially sounding the, the death knell for still Pinot Noir in Burgundy and then sparkling Pinot Noir in Champagne um, as those regions by implication become unsuitable due to climate change? Very good question. Um, yeah, we looked at the very best vintages in Champagne in the Pinot Noir growing areas of Champagne, um, predominantly 2008, 2012, quite recent vintages that were given really, really high ratings by a range of experts. Those vintage conditions look likely to be replicated in large parts of the UK going forward over the next 20 years. Burgundy less so. There's less evidence that Burgundy extremely high vintage conditions will be replicated. Barden greater replicability. So there is this shift northwards To answer your question about what it means for those regions, I think if we put this research in a European or international perspective, it's very worrying. Um, Those regions have had good vintages lately, but and we don't know what the absolute upper threshold is for ripening Pinot Noir. But if we look at droughts, if we look at extreme heats, if we look at wildfires in other parts of the world, these are threatening conditions for producers. So... I wouldn't say we're necessarily seeing a tipping point, but we're seeing a shift. And if we keep going on the trend, the warming trend that we're seeing now, it won't be too long before it becomes too hot within some of those regions to keep producing the Pinot Noir stars that have been produced in the past. Are we the new Burgundy, I wonder? But just talking about that, what about Chardonnay? You know, you say that the in the report that the exceptional red Burgundy vintages, 2005, 2015, they're very unlikely, very unlikely, 5 to 10% of years they might happen in the UK. So why did you focus on Pinot Noir and not Chardonnay, which obviously wouldn't need such heat? Yeah, we, we, we chose Pinot Noir simply because it was a really well-known um, red wine or red grape for red wine variety. Um, we also chose it because it's commonly grown in the UK already for sparkling wine and there's some trailblazers making still red wine. And of course, because there's an analogy between Champagne, where Pinot Noir is grown, and the UK. But we do also mention you know, the, the potential for still Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc and other white varieties in the report. Um, 
we could take our findings and we could probably um, replicate those for Chardonnay. Um, there's not a significant difference in terms of growing season profile or temperature requirements. So you could take a lot of what we found and replace the word Pinot Noir for Chardonnay. And exactly as we found with Pinot Noir, we will find increasing potential for still Chardonnay production in the UK. And we will see increasing potential for Sauvignon Blanc and other commonly known still white. So you say this transition is about the UK moving from a minor scale wine producer to a high quality wine region that significantly alters the world wine map. That is quite a claim. Yeah, it, it, it is. And and it's interesting. And when when I go out to international conferences and speak to people in warmer, drier areas of the world, they're talking about threats. They're talking about serious challenges that threaten their future. And they're looking at what they can do to adapt, what they can do to mitigate. But as I said, if, if conditions keep changing as they are now, there is a point at which they won't be able to adapt any further. And that's a serious challenge to the world wine map as we know it. Conversely, we're in a almost perverse situation where we're looking at climate change as an opportunity, an underlying opportunity in the UK. And all of the evidence points to a huge land area in the UK that is potential, has potential for vine growing, that is really high quality. The rate of planting, the rate of wine production in the UK is increasing extremely fast, 400% in the last few years alone. There are international companies buying land, making wine in the UK, establishing a presence here. And I sit here both as sort of an academic and someone who runs a business that helps set up vineyards and the demand, the interest is really high. If in the UK, the market potential can keep up with the supply, there is a significant opportunity. And the only other thing I'd add to that is it's not just the UK that's expanding. Sweden is seeing viticulture become one of the fastest growing agricultural sectors. Belgium is, Denmark is, Canada is. So this shift in the world wine map beyond the traditional world regions is really happening. And it's exciting for those who are involved at this end of it. It's also very worrying for people in the warmer, drier, threatening areas of the world. So it might be exciting for us and the, the cooler countries you talked about, but you do also warn, which may affect them as well, you warn in the report that the rapidly changing UK climate requires the industry to remain, as you put it, climate agile yeah. and not lock in production, which can't adapt to the changing growing conditions. What do you mean by that? And you know, how does a producer make sure that they are climate agile and not lock in? Yeah, so th this actually leads on to another piece of work that's a uh, research that's taking place now. But what we mean by that is if we look at elsewhere in the world and we look at some of the challenges that occur when um, appellation rules, for example, are very strict and mean that um, growers do not have the agility, the flexibility to adapt to different growing season conditions. When you look at Bordeaux this year, Special derogation had to be approved in parts of Bordeaux to irrigate for the first time in 70 years, but it was very difficult. Um, only certain varieties can be grown in certain locations. We're starting to see a relaxation in parts of France around some of those rules, but there is a risk that if you go, if we enter into a system which is very rigid in terms of what you can grow, where you can grow it, how you can manage the vineyard, what your yields are, what the sugar acid parameters are, etc., you we use the term lock-in, you're locking in producers to a way, a very rigid way of production, which means they don't have the flexibility to adapt to changing conditions. And that's what we mean. So the call, if you like, the finding in the research is conditions are changing in the UK. They're going to continue to change. You need a, a production sector and a market that will be able to cope with that demand and operate flexibly, both in terms of growing, making and wine styles. And I think I used the phrase earlier, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I think that's the key take home message. So you, you would be saying to the industry, you know, we, we're lucky we don't have too much regulation right now. Absolutely. Don't go down that route. Yeah, that's that that is the main finding. Don't go down the route of locking yourself into a system and a style of wine, which all your branding, all your regulations are signed up to that makes it very difficult to then um, escape from. And, and given we have this inherent variability year on year in the UK of climate, you know, overall, obviously, we are getting warmer, but the, the, the weather year on year is so variable. How can UK wine growers overcome that or 
cope with it. It, it, it is very difficult. And you're, it's a really good point. And, and you're right to point it out in that, um, yeah, the underlying message is warming, growing season conditions are positive. We still get variability, frost, extreme heat, rain at the wrong time of year, too much rain during the growing season, etc. One of the beauties is we have a relatively flexible system at the moment in terms of how you can manage your vineyard and what you can make from the grapes you grow in your vineyard. We also have a really high skilled workforce and there is a real need and need for a focus on keeping and growing that skilled workforce in the UK so that people have the skills to be able to adapt to challenging conditions, whether that's fighting frost, pruning at different times of year, dealing with disease pressure in vineyards in different ways, et cetera, et cetera. Really, it's using the skills that are at our disposal or need to be at our disposal to manage that variability. So as part of your research, you looked in detail at what are the best and worst locations for wine growing across the UK. What can you tell us about that? What did you find? (laughs) Um, We found that um, the the southeast, unsurprisingly, where most vineyards are located at the moment, is going to continue to increase in terms of suitability. But what we also found was there's areas of the UK that are, um, if you like, untapped for viticulture that have high potential now and increasing potential going forward. Um, And those are areas uh, predominantly around um, the east of England, Cambridgeshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex in particular, um, Oxfordshire, and then Berkshire, and a few other locations like parts of southeast Wales, the Severn Estuary, which are traditional fruit-growing parts of the country, where growing season temperatures are are warm, um, as warm as other parts of the UK, and there is significant potential there. So We do expect to see this broadening out of um, viticulture, vine growing potential in the UK. And with that will come a range of different wine styles. And in terms of still wine specifically, where do you predict is going to be the best area? The the main areas that we identified for still Pinot Noir production were in Essex, Suffolk, parts of Cambridgeshire, i.e. Eastern England. And that's because they're warm they're dry, they're relatively stable year on year. And in a lot of those areas, there's lower frost risk. So finally, how do you see the future of UK wine? Positively, <laughs> both, in terms of, um, both in terms of opportunity for growing, but also in terms of quality and in terms of desirability. Um, there's a beautiful story about English sparkling wine as a homegrown product. Um, it's a luxury product. The quality is really high. We're seeing more and more interest in certainly growing. We're seeing more interest in buying. So in terms of the near future, so I'm only talking the next 20 years, we see um, significant opportunity and potential. What I would caveat with is coming back to the core subject of climate change. If we continue the projection beyond 2040, some of the challenges that other wine producing countries of the world are experiencing now, we're going to experience too. It doesn't stop, in other words. So until we get a grip on climate change and can kind of have a bigger impact on mitigating, reducing it, um, the challenges in the future are not to be underestimated. Dr. Alistair Nesbitt, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. The challenges are not to be underestimated. Too um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to get stuck into here, isn't there? There is, there really is. Um, but I wonder if it's it's just worth a really quick recap of his research and what we've discussed mm, yeah, you, so good far. Idea, good yeah? Idea, yeah. Okay, so, so climate change. The temperature in the UK is rising. In mm. the next 20 odd years, this will mean better sparkling wine vintages. Yeah, good point. Important to it, talk about sparkling But too. it will also mean still wines become a bigger part of the repertoire, including mm. reds and other varieties that haven't really worked in the UK up to now. Mm. You know, Alistair mentioned and Sauvignon Blanc, but mm. we also talked afterwards about Semillon, even Riesling. Mm. You know, and more of the UK in general will become suitable for wine growing, not just the South. Yeah, and, and but not forgetting at the same time the challenges, which, which mm. you mentioned, that are part of this change. Um, so, you know, things like spring frost, yeah. rainfall at flowering, more extreme weather events, um, more unpredictability generally. You know, and, 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 and importantly, things are going to be very worrying, in his words, for other yeah. regions outside the UK, which are going to have to adapt and embrace change. I think that's uh, key. Which yeah. is already, already yeah, yeah. sort of on us, you know, which is extra difficult if you have strict rules governing what you can and you can't do, like the famous appellation systems of, of France, Italy, Spain, Germany, you know. And who knows, at the end of it all, 
where this is going to end. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. But but maybe let's start there. You know, what Alistair says about the importance of staying climate agile and mm. not tying mm. yourself down with rules. Yeah. You know, at the moment, most of the UK is actually pretty free to do what it wants. Mm. Um, the one big headline-grabbing exception to mention here is the Sussex PDO, which was recently... And, and controversially. ...brought in, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, ostensibly, the idea is to ensure a higher standard for sparkling wines made in Sussex. But bringing in rules around what producers can and can't do in order to achieve that Sussex PDO status, that's doing exactly the opposite of what Alistair recommends. Yeah, it is, it is. Which is why more than one producer we've spoken to lately has called it madness. Mm, I think that's that's the... Uh, other words that, that we Exactly, that's the version we, we can actually repeat. repeat. Uh, there's many other words. I know we were in Kent, so that might have something to do with it, being a neighbour <laughs> of Sussex, but still, feeling's clearly running high about this, and, yeah. and this, this is a really, really topical issue. Yeah. Um, but I think we broadly agree. That it is slight madness. You know, if you can already use the term Sussex or Kent on your bottle, why on earth would you dream up a whole load of red tape to wrap yourself up in when it's just not needed? Yeah, and it's and it's not as if it'll necessarily confer any quality message to your average mm. wine drinker. Mm. You know, brands are still way more important in terms of generating confidence. Mm. And and the point is you you can't taste that it's from Sussex or distinguish it meaningfully from Kent or Hampshire you know mm. certainly not yet anyway so we'd say yes protect things that have a, a long legacy or identifiable character but this is really not the thing to be doing right now for English wine no no and it's an interesting point about the future of appellations more widely in the wine world too isn't it um mm. you know controlled appellations sort of came into being in the 20th century yeah. to I don't know, to protect wines from fraud, really. And and there's still a bit of that about, of course, but it's a different world now. Mm. And and yes, okay, you have got to keep an eye on the bad guys, whatever, fraud prevention. But what's more pressing now is the threat of climate change and being able to stay sort of flexible and, and adapt, uh, as Alistair says, you know, yeah. plant other varieties, you know, if yeah, you need exactly. to change cultural methods, if you need to start yeah. irrigating, whatever. Yeah. So actually, I think we may actually see wine, the wine world in general, moving away from yeah. strict rules and regulations. Yeah, so and, for English and, wine to be going the opposite direction seems, <laughs> seems slightly crazy. bonkers. Crazy, yeah, yeah. But talking about other varieties, Alistair did mention the likes of Semillon and Riesling as potentials for the UK as the climate warms up. Um, and and, and I, also on that point, I did just want to mention that Alistair says it's still too cold for Riesling, certainly over the next yeah. 18 to 20 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. However, one grower we spoke to who um, tends to have pretty strong views about things, <laughs> Owen Elias at Balfour, he said a great English Riesling would be made before 2030. Mm, so I did. just wanted to get that yeah. in there. Bit of controversy. Yeah. Who will be proved right? The doctor versus... Elias. Elias. There we are. You can see the billboards now. <laughs> I like that. Love it's it. like a film title. A showdown over... Exactly. You should have written The Doctor versus, versus Elias. Elias. It's a showdown over Riesling. <laughs> uh, we can, maybe we can officiate. You did say great in there. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah. all the subject to varieties. We'd still say Chardonnay was our favourite grape variety for English still wines, wouldn't we? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. When we tasted through a whole range recently, including what were almost all of England's top still wines, we thought the Pinots, the red Pinots, were really good. But the Chardonnays were, without doubt, the most impressive. The mm. wines we mm. kept coming back to. Yeah. Mm. They have lovely complexity, but also refreshing acidity, which you just don't necessarily get these days from European regions that you, that you used to get that acidity yeah. from. Yeah, uh, yeah. And interestingly, in terms of wine stars, Alistair said off tape, didn't he, that he's mm. been seeing a huge rise in, did, in interest in, 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 in planting rose. to make premium rosé, yeah. Yeah. which he found striking because, you know, up till now, it's sort of been an afterthought making mm. rosé. Uh, apart from maybe there's one or two exceptions out there. Yeah, but, some people have you know, done it deliberately. Yeah, now yeah. it actually implies that. people are thinking about selling the wine before planting, which is which is very rare in yeah, the wine world, isn't good, it? Because yeah. rosé is is a growth category in wine, one of the few, um, especially pricey rosé. You look at all these super duper uh, mm. Provencal cuvées yeah, yeah. coming out. Um, plus, you can get rosé to market far quicker than traditional methods of sparkling wine. So it's a really interesting trend that one. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good point. You know, it's it's one thing making all this English wine but is it going to sell mm. but despite all the doom mongers of the last decade or so and there's many. been quite a few haven't there mm. it, it really does seem to be selling doesn't it, it does, yeah. I mean sales are up 
31% year on year in 2021 or were in 2021. Of and, English wine. Yeah, of English wine. And there's been an overall rise of 69% from 2019 to 2021. So to give you an idea, over 9 million bottles were sold in 2021. And that's about an average year's production, isn't it? That's really it? interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah, a lot of people were saying this would never sell. Yeah. Um, that was, so 70% rise over two yeah. years. That's yeah. that's interesting, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? I, mean, I wonder what effect yeah. the pandemic and lockdowns had in that. But anyway, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's promising, I it suppose. It is promising. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also seems to be more and more options of wines to buy as well, aren't we? As you said, you know, yeah. we're seeing sort of real diversity of styles mm. emerging, even among the still wines. Yeah. Um, so I suppose on the one hand, that's exciting. But then, of course, you have to catch yourself in all of this and always and think, but the reasons behind this change are also quite scary. They are. You know, they Alistair are. did I use know. the words exciting yeah. and very, very worrying in the same breath. Yeah, he? yeah. You and know. fair enough. Um, he also um. used the term worst case scenario. <laughs> it, he managed to use that in a kind of positive sense. Which, you know, that's never a good thing, it's is it? Worst not case really. Scenario? No, no, indeed. No, indeed. Anyway, so perhaps that's our, our, that's our cue to, yeah, to maybe, move on maybe, before we get too, too depressing. Yeah. Um, but I should add, I'm going to just add this before we do that. For the benefit of our friends over the border, we did ask about the viability of Scotland <laughs> for did. serious yeah. wine growing in mm-hmm. the near future sadly mm. Alistair poured cold water on that one yeah. literally didn't yeah. he yeah. because he said the rain is still the number one limiting factor no matter where you are in Scotland so I'm sorry there you go yeah anyway so our plans for Scottish wine are dashed Scottish Chardonnay well we'll see you never know you never know <laughs> anyway, from Scotland to Kent uh, we went to Gusborne to talk to Charlie Holland who's head winemaker and the first question uh, was how the 2022 vintage is looking 2022 is looking fantastic uh, a really really good vintage high sugars but good acidity lots of flavour a real broad palate uh, so it's always fun when you have lots of different flavour profiles when you come to blending. Is it smaller or, or larger? A- about spot on, about usual. So our sort of average average yield, slightly down, I think, probably uh, to, to do with all the hot weather we had in the summer. Uh, so I think we had smaller, smaller berries. And thinking about that, are you noticing the effects of climate change? Yes. I mean, yeah, we're living climate change. It's very real to us on a, on a day-to-day basis. Uh, and everything we see each year completely changes. Um, you know, it's it's now common to have a period at some point during the growing season of over 35 degrees for two or three days. And that's happened now for for the last few years, probably bar 2021, but before that. And is that okay? It's fine. I mean, I think, you know, ultimately uh, vines are Mediterranean weeds, aren't they? So they're used to that sort of uh, heat. Um, we did find it was the lack of rain, I think, as opposed to the heat beforehand. So we did find in the middle of that 38 degrees that there was the middle of the day, the leaves were quite warm and starting to droop a bit, but only for a couple of hours. And then it came back after that. So the established vines, I think, are absolutely fine. I think people with new vineyards might struggle a bit this year because of lack of water. And so would you say positive or negative, the effects or both? For, for us this year, the heat wasn't an issue, I think. Um, I mean, actually, it's the it's the rain that comes later when you've got these lovely, nicely formed berries and get lots of rain. Um, and that's probably the biggest challenge, I think, from, from you know, climate change is unpredictable weather patterns. So, you know, that hot weather might occur, but we don't know if it's going to come in June uh during flowering brilliant or it's going to happen later on this, in the year and then you often get a big dump of rain and when's that going to come um so it's very difficult to plan for and you're expecting one thing and something else doesn't turn up uh, on the positive side you know we, we can we can grow grapes now to a level that we just couldn't do you know when i first started english wine 17 years ago the idea that we'd regularly regularly be making wines of 12 and a half 13 percent alcohol from natural sugars I would have told you you're you're off your rocker. So the fact that we're doing that is amazing. Uh, it's a real thing, but it's not a plain sailing. It comes with a lot of challenges. And Eng- England's always been about challenges and rising to those as a new world um, yeah. region. So, so thinking about what you can do now, um, and on the back of the research that's been recently um, recently released, it looked very much at red Pinot Noir and the potential for red Pinot Noir. What's your opinion on that yeah we love red pinot noir and making still wines and we've been doing it for a number of years now i mean the first time we did it was 2009 um and you know i'll be the first to admit i think from those times with the wines come on leaps and bounds part of that is climate change and part of that is just an understanding of 
your soils and the grapes, but there's a huge potential there. Um, and at the moment, it's almost looking like, you know, you have the, the law of uh, zeros and fives in Bordeaux. It's kind of even years in England seems to be doing well. So 2014, 16, 18, 20, and hopefully 22 all look like exceptional years for, for still wine production. So what do you see for the, for the future of UK still wines? I think, you know, there's, there's huge opportunity. And in the same way as countries like, I guess, uh, New Zealand's known for Sauvignon Blanc, but they produce a wide range of amazing wines now. Um, in the same way, I think we had sparkling wine, and that's what we knew we could compete with and make exceptional wines that can beat, beat the rest of the wines from around the world. Um, but on the back of that, what people are really excited about is all the still wines. For me, particularly, Chardonnay and Pinot, um, especially in the light of the backdrop of Burgundy and the prices going up and and perhaps some places traditionally making wine that it's more challenging to do that. There's a real opportunity to move into that space. And, um, you know, we do a lot of tastings with our wines against, you know, Old World Burgundy, but also um, New Zealand, Australia, California. And they stand up, you know, they stand up blind next to them. And that's hugely exciting. So England stepping into the shoes of Burgundy and California. Mm. Uh, that's quite a thought, isn't it? it um, is. But you have to say <laughs> the prices for English wine are getting quite punchy. So it's not as if there's a huge, huge price differential there now. Mm, that is true. Although, I mean, it, it's all relative and Burgundy can frankly be stratospheric <laughs> where true. England is just pricey. Um, yeah. And the broader mm. point is perhaps that it may simply be less and less viable for some parts of mm. Burgundy to keep making Pinot Noir in the style that we, we're used to and we like. Yeah, that's a sobering thought, isn't it? If ever there was one. It really is, anyway. isn't it? Um, but there was one interesting yeah. point from our discussion mm. after we recorded, uh, wasn't there, about the commercial potential for English still wine. Yeah, so we, we've touched on how we, yeah. we, we have touched on how critics tend to complain about the high prices for English wine and raise doubts over how well it will sell. Yeah. But what we're hearing from the vineyards right now is that it's not just sparkling selling, but the stills too. Mm. You know, particularly... Mm. Pinot Noir seems to be flying off the shelves. Yeah. You know, so, so Charlie, for example, said that they have at times recently used their still red Pinot Noir, which has been a real trailblazer, hasn't it, for yeah, English red? We should yeah, say that, you know, and, yeah. and the 2014 Pioneers. and 18 Gusborne Pinots are amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but what Charlie was saying was that because that is on allocation, the Pinot, they've used it to sell their sparkling. So they'll say to restaurants, you can have some Pinot Noir if you put our brut on by the glass. <laughs> Good tactic. I mean, he says, Charlie says, you know, if you'd told him this 15 years ago, he would have said you were yeah. bonkers. That's the thing, isn't it? You know, I mean, yeah. you know, who would have who would have predicted that? I don't think less than 15 years ago, frankly, well, probably know, five how, years ago, two years ago. Change, how yeah. times change, you know. I mean, haven't you talked about this sort of change uh, in terms of theatre as you as you always As I always would. would. You know, <laughs> I think you said sort of like, so like the third act. Is that right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, this is this is um, how I've put it, what I've, I've written about. Yes. Mm. So so the, the first act of English wine would be the still wines, the still white wines made in a Germanic style. Yeah, sort of um, blue nunny type thing. Sort of, yeah. That yeah. might be traduced. Yeah, a little bit unfair, unfair, but, you know, wine, right? <laughs> floral, a little bit off dry, and they were in the mid twentieth century, very light and you know just just you know easy drinking. Then we got into the traditional method sparkling wine from the nineteen mm. nineties onwards, muscling in on champagnes ter- that's really territory. Our USP, our calling yeah, now, yeah, yeah, it still the, the, is. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. But I mean, wine. you know, and that was our sort of second act, if if you like. But now we are without doubt seeing the third act, the rise of the new wave of still wines, particularly Chardonnay and Pinot. Noir. And that era really has already begun. Mm. You call it the Red Dawn. Oh, you it? could. If you, if you were movily, movily, movily minded. minded. Back to our movie trailers. Gosh, how many movies are you going <laughs> to How many start? movies can you get? Anyway, uh, perhaps on that note, we should one, hear one from episode. Fergus Elias, who's winemaker at Balfour in Kent. Um, and one thing to note before the interview is that Fergus's dad, Owen, who we've already mentioned in mm. this episode, uh, works with him at Balfour. They're, they're quite a comedy duo together, aren't they? You get them together, they're brilliant. <laughs> they're they, just, they just work off each other. I think they should have their they're own TV show. Dry English to be uh, Anyway, uh, Owen is a bit of a legend in English wine. You know, he's been making wines for many, many years. Yeah, yeah, he? yeah. And he's a real believer in and, and has been for quite some time in the potential of still wines in England, including Riesling, as we heard yeah, earlier. Yes. Uh, now, he promised us on tape that English Riesling 
is coming. Again, that is a strap line for a movie, isn't it? <laughs> Mind you, it makes Riesling sound like some sort of demon or it monster. It does indeed. You know, it? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I started by asking Fergus about whether he was noticing the effects of climate change. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's. I don't get frustrated. That's the wrong word. But there's a, there's a lot of sort of almost it almost makes us look gloating when people talk about English wine and climate change, and all of a sudden we're all very pleased about climate change. It's like, oh, we're winning in climate change. And we're, we're, yes, our vintage dates are coming forward, and yes, we're ripening varieties more easily than we were. Um, but actually, it's much harder to grow grapes because you've got later spring frosts, you've got earlier winter frosts. The winter doesn't get as cold. It doesn't get as so you, you don't get that nice dormant period that we used to get. So it's definitely helping English wine, but I I, I, loathe, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like I'm excited by that because I, <laughs> it come with it comes a lot of new challenges that we've not had to face before. And and just looking at this research, um, it suggests that um, there's going to be a lot more potential for really high quality still wine going forward over the next twenty years, particularly red pinot noir it, it looks at what what do you think of that oh, well i think if you asked my father he'd <laughs> you'd have heard he's been saying that for about 20 years now um dad made pinot noir at chapel down for, for way back in the 1990s and we've we've held here we've always had we've always said that you can make a you can make a good pinot noir in pretty much any vintage we even made one in 2021 it was one barrel um so it never it never made it out of the winery but it's you know it's it's i think yes there's real potential for pinot real potential for high quality red we're planting gamay at the moment or went in last year so we've got four acres of gamay um and you know I'd, i want to be making more gone that'd be nice <laughs> wouldn't it just <Jess>? <laughs> <Modest>. <laughs> and and focus what do you see as the future for for uk wine more still definitely i think I think we've 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 all we all make sparkling and we make fabulous sparkling wine, but I think still wine has huge potentials. Chardonnay, I think, will be the variety of choice. Um, I, I don't dislike Bacchus. We make a very nice Bacchus, but I think Chardonnay is the real the real star for for still whites and for still reds. Probably Pinot, but I think Gamay's got a good shot. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. I'm I'm really excited. Actually, it's quite it's quite an encouraging time to be working here. <laughs> Interesting he tips Chardonnay mm-hmm. as the star variety in the UK, like us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're on track. We're on you know, great minds. Um, and intriguing <gasps> on the Gamay Sozzled front, uh, isn't it? You know, yeah, sorry, Gamay, stop, yeah. Next stop, Cru Beaujolais. Yeah, it would make an interesting <laughs> counterpart to Pinot Noir, wouldn't it? It really would. But he also said afterwards how they're starting to make barrel-aged Albarino. Yeah. And he's trying to convince people to plant Aligote. That's an interesting one, isn't it? The other, the other mm. the forgotten white of Burgundy. Mm. Apparently not with much success yet. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah, they are planning to plant Riesling. Yeah, and of course they do make that sort of lovely red Pinot Meunier. Oh, yeah. The Red Miller. back oh, they in They made make. it back in 2018. Mm. And they, everyone's been telling them to do it since. And, <laughs> and, and, and they refuse. But in, in fact, you know, I would say about Balfour, their winemakers collection wines are well worth checking out. Which the they? Red Miller was part of. Yes, that that's Pinot right. Part you know, of, yeah. Even yeah, if, are. and I'm going to throw this in there, even if the pricing can be bonkers. Using that on word those again. Wines. Bonkers yeah. is a word we're cropping up a bit in this episode, isn't it? Maybe, maybe not bonkers, but it's a So we've a bit got steep. a glass of their Gatehouse Pinot Noir here, yeah. which is absolutely it is glorious. Good. It's yeah. delicious Pinot Noir. It's yeah. complex, it's savoury, it's a mm. bit wild and funky, it's elegant, mm. uh, you know. It won gold at Wine GB didn't it did it this indeed. year, twenty twenty two. But 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 it's sixty pounds a <laughs> bottle. I mean, we're very lucky to have this. I'm oh, sort of yeah, stroking oh, yeah. it gently. <laughs> we got the sent the sample, but that's way too much. It's, isn't it? it's a bit too much. It's a bit too much. Um, and we've got a, we've got a, anyway. I'm going to move on. We've got another Pinot Noir here from Essex, Danbury Ridge. That's mm. thirty eight pounds. Yeah. Really beautiful stuff from a region we're going to be hearing a lot more of in terms of top quality English wine, sparkling, but also very much the stills. Mm, well, Essex and sort of East Anglia. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. yeah. But, but just going back and picking up on, on the point of, of price, I really think, unfortunately, there is a kind of price inflation war going on in English wine, sort mm. of chest beating, my wine's pricier than yours. Um, you know, with producers looking at what the most expensive wine is out there, comparable to theirs, and, and trying to top it. And, and I think it's just really unfortunate. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. And it risks alienating wine lovers and supporters of English wine. I totally, totally agree. You know, I think I think 
I don't know, you can understand people wanting to be ambitious with their pricing. There's an element of our wine's good and it's really difficult to make. And so we can put it in a, where we think it deserves to and be. And they don't want it to appear to be less good than their neighbours. I, do but you think, think, oh, I really? just think there's just an element of let's just price it higher than that guy next door. Yeah. Uh, and, and limited it's, quantities and, it's just and all that sort of thing. It's such a shame when you see yeah. these beautiful wines and you know that lots of people aren't going to be able to taste them because yeah. it's just too expensive. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, that's probably us with our consumer hats <laughs> on and with just consumer It would just be hats, nice but... to see them a bit, some of them a little bit lower. Yeah, yeah. anyway. But um, looking specifically at Pinot Noir, which we're talking about, let's hear briefly from Ben Wall. Gate at Tillingham, uh, which is an innovative, um, can we say natural? I think he'd be happy with that. Sort of in that realm. Uh, Well, it's just (laughs) unique, isn't it? uh, (laughs) He's an innovative producer down in Kent, uh, making everything from pet nat to verjuice to an infusion rosé that Ben actually describes as probably illegal. Mind you, you did say that to me. Well, away. maybe not because there aren't too many rules and regulations. Well, maybe it isn't. Maybe at the moment maybe it might be illegal. It's just in a the cool future. rosé. It is. Very it's just cool. It's just, rose, cool. Yeah. it's just cool. We can agree on that. Uh, so we stood in his vineyard in the sun uh, and the wind. So sorry about the sound of it. Uh, we tried to control it as much as we could. But anyway, we asked him for his take on Alison Nesbitt's research. I mean, I think the the data in itself is 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 pretty undeniable. I mean, Alistair Nesbitt's research and what that's looking at in terms of modelling the future um, of still wines in general. I think you know, you know, Pinot, Pinot Noir could be the, you know, it's got the most recall. It's got it's, it's sexy. It's got the most demand. Um, but um, yeah, and I think that's got an incredible future. I think we're seeing it now. Um, but then also, I think we've got we've got a way to go to learn how to make English Pinot Noir too. Um, and I'm still finding out and I want to show you some of my my attempts over the last few years um, but I, I think it's got a really bright future. Do you think there's going to be something that we say is English Pinot Noir or will it always remain kind of it depends who's making it? Uh, ooh, that's a tough question I think. Um, I, I struggled a bit with um, like adopting PDOs and things like that at this really early stage in our industry because I think it, it, there's there's a lot of merits to it but there's also kind of like we haven't really I don't think identified um, where the best varieties sit it's like you know in, in France that appellation system has evolved over practically millennia right and we've been going what feels like five minutes um, and I think I think time will tell and for the moment I think it's all about the grower it's all about the farming and it's all about the winemaker because um, there's so much inconsistency I think between examples of English Pinot. There's some absolutely amazing stuff and there's some stuff which if it's 15, 20 pounds a bottle, I don't think is internationally is is there. Um, I might be being too harsh. I don't know. <laughs> so in general, how do you see the future for UK still wines? I think it's really, really bright. Um, I just think the um, metrics about sort of how much demand there's going to be versus the supply and the price point is is a bit of an unknown. But I think the best the best examples of English Pinot do deserve to be up there with the best of Otago or Oregon or even Burgundy. I think we are sort of on the wild, wild west of of winemaking, if you like. It's sort of frontier country, isn't it? And I think we need to get to know what we what we can achieve and what we can do and you know varietally wise as well um you know we shouldn't just slavishly follow um and you know there's there's room for a lot of innovation and we'll find find our own way uh, for sure Wild west of winemaking. I feel like we should get some sound effects in here of sort of whooping <laughs> so and shooting. we're now into shooting a, a cowboy and, and movie. Exactly. Moving, <laughs> segwaying absolutely seamlessly. Anyway, um, just really interesting, his point that English winemakers are still discovering what's possible. You know, and it will take time to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Ben's encouraging people to be bold, to experiment like he is, you know, mm. by using quevery and um, advocating regenerative agriculture, sourcing grapes from all over, growing things mm. like Shannon and Trousseau, you yeah, know. Yeah, Trousseau's a really yeah, interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah why yeah. not? Have a go. You know, and again, he makes the point that it's best to do this without the restrictive presence of PDOs or appellations. You know, mm. he makes mm. up to 20 different wines every vintage. And we're not talking big quantities, you know, 30,000 bottles in in total of wine. Yeah, yeah. I think they've really been leaders in the innovation front, haven't they? they have. Showing what's possible. Yeah. Um, Along got, with others, but you know, yes, ben but you need these kind of these uh, centres, hubs, if you like, yeah. of innovation, and you need them all over, don't yeah, you? Yeah, and yeah. he's been a really, Risk really, takers. they've been a really, really good one down in Kent near yeah. the coast. Um, yeah. So it's such a lovely place. Oh, there, it's isn't it? you know, gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Tillingham is 
gorgeous. We, it's just well worth visiting, uh, whether you're a wine lover or you just like the English countryside or whatever. Uh, it's a beautiful spot with a hotel. Is it? Can we call it's, it a hotel? Is it a hotel yeah, or is it I guest mean, rooms? I mean, it's, no, it's a hotel. It's a, it's a hotel. Yeah, yeah, it is actually yeah, a very yeah. small, lovely hotel. Boutique Sensational hotel. Sensational restaurant. Fabulous restaurant. Oh, my word. Yeah, it was yeah. just so delicious. And then, of course, you've got the pigs and the sheep and the chickens all over the place. And you've got the tastings to do at the winery. We went there in harvest time and people were just tasting around the sorting table. Constantly, right? It's yeah, really yeah, cool. Yeah. You know, and there's the, is it a pizza restaurant they got outside? There's a pizza um, place outside for the, for the summer, summer yeah. you know. And I think I they know. just have so much going on. They don't do, and they? it's just—I don't know—it's one point that Ben made they, they, about regenerative viticulture, but also, you know, they are regenerating what was a traditional, the model of a traditional English farm that's that's sort of relatively small scale. Yeah. It's great to see that being revived. You know, yeah. in the name of wine, yeah, who'd have yeah. thought it? I know, I know. Now, our last stop on our English harvest road trip round Kent was Westwell. Adrian and Galia Pike are no strangers to innovation themselves. Mm. Um, you just need to uh, to glance at their funky labels, which were designed yeah. by yeah. Galia. They're all here. designed by Galia. Yeah. Very clever artists. Uh, and you just need to look at those to see that uh, these aren't your average run-of-the-mill English wines. Mm. Um, now, they're very excited about the potential of their 2022 harvest. And so, again, I asked Adrian about climate change. I think we notice the effects of climate change more in terms of just kind of unpredictable weather. So rather than seeing this kind of temperature change, which is going to mean that we all end up with much, much better fruit and we've got these fantastic vintages, it's more lots of the same weather at the same time. So when rain comes, it tends to be lots of rain for a long period of time. Um, and obviously the sunshine in August, you know, we had a, a sunshine for a really, really long time, but then we also had the deluge of rain straight afterwards. So that kind of affects us. So is it mainly managing the unpredictability? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously, as you're well aware, kind of growing, trying to grow grapes in England is pretty marginal as it is. And with all these kind of weather events happening, it, it, um, it can become really tricky. And obviously, you have some kind of crucial points throughout the year. And one thing that we've been beset by, rather than frost, which obviously comes first and, and is a problem for quite a lot of people, but our height... And um, our slope means that we're kind of protected from the frost, but we do get rain at flowering, um, and that can be a real issue. So just thinking about the recent research that's that's come out, uh, looking at still wines and particularly still red wines, mm. obviously um, it's saying there's a great potential for higher quality and more red wines. What would you say to that? I mean, it really depends what happens throughout the rest of the year. I mean, they're basically talking about the temperature rising and there being more sun and warmer weather throughout August and September, which obviously can really help. But if you have frost early on in the, in the vintage and you have rain at flowering, then that's not really going to help with those two things. And how do you see the future for UK still wines over the next 20 years? I mean, I think still wines in the UK are really interesting. I mean, at the moment we have we don't have any, um, unlike in other areas of the world where you have um, kind of you know, AOCs in France or what have you, where you've got rules and you have to fit in with particular things. At the moment, you don't have anything like that in the UK. And I think that's to our advantage in that we can create wines in any way that we want to. Um, I mean, as you know, our skin contact wine and our, our um, Ortega that's aged in Amphora, I think those those things can be really interesting. Ortega's a great, great for playing with. But this year we're making a, Pinot, a white Pinot Meunier um, I think the kind of floral arom aromatics of Pinot Meunier work really well um, and should work really well as a white. So we're going to try that. But I think there's just so much opportunity in England for doing those kind of things. I think that's really cool. Really cool. I like that. Mm. Uh, cool Britannia strikes again. Here we go. Adrian uh, is cool, isn't he? He is. Well, they both are. They're both yeah, lovely yeah. people and very cool. And the dogs are cool as well. And it's, 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 it's not <laughs> just the, the dogs. The cool. It, it, everything's cool. <laughs> and it's the, the, the dogs and the labels. But, you know, the wines are really quite cool and good yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they make they make particularly really interesting Ortega mm. uh, in a couple of different styles. It's it's actually a, quite a versatile grape. And, and Adrian makes one of them in, in Amphora. Mm. Now, we heard very about cool. the white Pinot Meunier that they're, they're planning on making, but they also do a semi-carbonic red blend of Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir, again aged in amphora. That's the that's the mm. double Pinot. And then when we've got here the field, mm. which I love, yeah. which is again a red, a blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier that are co-fermented. Now it's light, but it's beautifully mm. funky. If mm. you can be beautifully mm. funky, uh, it, it's foody. It's refreshingly different. Mm. 
it's so nice to, to see English wines, English reds embracing that lightness. You yeah. can be light and still be absolutely delicious. Yeah, D- not light on flavour, lots of flavour. Refreshingly different. Anyway, yeah. I think that's, that's a brilliant strap line for the new breed of English red wines. <laughs> Coming to wine bars all around the world, near you very soon. Here we go. <laughs> OK, so by way of recap of all mm. of this, climate mm. change is going to mean more English still wine, including red and better sparkling too. But the bigger picture is, of course, that urgent action is still needed to combat climate change, not just for the sake of other wine regions around the world, but of course, for humanity itself. Mm. So the task ahead is clear and it's huge. At the same time, a refreshing glass of English Pinot can hopefully help to keep our spirits up when we need it most. Oh, our thanks to Dr. Alison Nesbitt, Charlie Holland, Fergus and Owen Elias, Ben Woolgate and Adrian and Galia Pike. And of course, thanks to you for joining us. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>